Hi everyone, my name is Junchen Yang. I'm a PhD student from Carnegie Mellon University. Today I'm going to talk about our work, a large scale analysis of hundreds of Imami Cash clusters at Twitter. This is a joint work with Yao and my advisor, Rashmi. Imami caches are widely deployed in, in the modern web services. Let's take Twitter as an example. When you open the Twitter app, the app sends requests to the edge servers. The edge server sends requests to different services. Each service sends a bunch of requests to different backends. In order to reduce latency, increase throughput, and reduce backend load, Imami caches are deployed between the services and the backend. Therefore, the user requests can be served in a timely manner. Although in-memory caches are widely deployed, there has been a lack of understanding of how in-memory caches are used in practice. So in this work, we started over 150 cache clusters at Twitter, try to understand how in-memory caches are used, and try to answer questions such as uh, whether existing assumptions about in-memory cache still hold. In today's talk, I'm going to follow on the four aspects. First, I'm going to talk about the three typical cache use cases. Second, I'm going to show um, really heavy workloads. Third, I'm going to talk about object size distribution and its evolution. And last, I'm going to talk about time to leave, which is short for TTL, and how it affects working set size and the design of eviction algorithms. First, Let's talk about um, how imam caches are deployed at Twitter. Twitter deploys imam cache as a single tenant, single layer cache using container um, technology. So each cache cluster um, is deployed using containers and each customer gets its own dedicated cache cluster. Here, a customer, customer means a service at Twitter. Twitter operates one of the largest scale um, cache uh, deployments. It has hundreds of cache clusters, serves billions of requests per second, it uses hundreds of terabyte DRAM for, for caching with hundreds of thousands of CPU calls. We collected week long ensemble traces from one instance of each term cache cluster. It consists of 700 billion requests and 80 terabyte in size. In today's talk, I'm going to focus on the 54 most representative cache clusters. The choices are open source at the following URL. First, let's talk about cache use cases. The, um, it is typically recognized at Twitter, there are three cache use cases. It's more or less the same at other companies. The first cache use case is caching for, uh, for storage. Caching for storage is the most common cache use case and you use the most resources. One example is um, caching of key value database. The second cache use case is caching for computation. Caching for computation has become increasingly popular nowadays because of use of machine learning and real-time stream processing. One example is um, the who to follow recommendation of Twitter. The third cache use case is storing transient data with no backing store. Technically speaking, this is not a a cache use case, but users do use cache for this type of um, usage. Two examples, one is uh, real limiters. The other one is negative cache. Negative cache stores the keys and or queries that do not exist in the database. This figure shows the results usage breakdown for the three use case. We observe that caching for storage accounts for most of the results usage, while Caching for computation and transient data um, also accounts for non-trivial amount of resource usage, especially caching for computation accounts for almost 20, uh, almost 50% of the clusters. Okay, now let's dive deep into the workloads or the traces. The first observation we have is read heavy workloads. Most of previous work assume in-memory cache serve a read heavy workload. It is true that at Twitter, read heavy workloads are the majority of the workloads. However, we observe that uh, around 35% of clusters are actually write heavy. By here, by write heavy, I mean it has more than 30% of writes. So that's uh, shown in this orange rectangle. 
So what does this mean for feature research? We believe that feature research should also optimize for write heavy workloads because write heavy workloads uh, poses more challenges because it, they are harder to scale to multiple cores because of evictions and expirations. And write heavy workloads have a longer tail latency in production. So that's write heavy workloads. Previous work have shown that object size in in-memory cache are usually small. At Twitter, we confirmed this observation and we observed that 20% of the cluster have a mean object size less than 100 bytes. And the medium is around 230 bytes. This figure shows the mean object size across clusters. So in other words, object size in imam cache are small. It means that um, the metadata size is relatively large compared to object size. For example, production system like memcached uses 56 bytes per object metadata. This is huge compared to uh, um, 230 bytes object. While um, research system, which aim to reduce misratio, often adds more metadata. And we, um, and adding more, met, more metadata to build better eviction algorithm sometimes leads to the opposite result because adding more bit metadata reduces the effective cache size. So therefore, we suggest that for future research on, on reducing misratio, researchers should also seek ways to minimize object met metadata as one way to increase effective cache size as, and reduce misratio. Okay, when object size is small, it's often the case that value size is small. Therefore, we characterize value over key size ratio across the clusters. And we show it in this figure. We observe that 15% of the cluster have value size less than or equal to key size, while 50% of the cluster have a value size less than or equal to five times key size. In other words, key size is large. So why are the key size large? We dig deeper and see how keys are composed. And we observe that it's often the case that keys are composed of namespace and object ID. For example, in one cache, we observe that um, the key is composed of um, namespace one column, namespace two column, object ID. In the other cache, we observe that the keys are composed of object ID slash namespace one slash namespace two. It's not hard to um, see that there are a lot of redundancy in the keys because of the namespace. Therefore, we suggest that future research should look into a way to, um, to compress the keys. And the key compression algorithm needs to be both robust and lightweight because the, um, the format of the key, and I mean, the key namespace and object ID, the format, it can be different between different clusters. Or it can also change um, during long time. Therefore, we believe that a robust lightweight key compression uh, is very useful in increasing in increasing the effective cache size. Okay, so far we have been looking at uh, static object size distribution. However, size di distribution are rather uh, seldom static. In this figure, we show how the size distribution change over time. The y-axis shows the request size. The x-axis shows the time. The color shows how many requests fall into each size bins in a time window. So for this figure, we observe that most of the requests are for um, objects belong to these two size bins. And this figure shows that the size distribution can be static over uh, one week. However, in most of workloads, we observe that it's not static. For example, in this figure, we show that the workload shows a dialog pattern. There are more, requ uh, more requests for objects belong to size, belong to uh, this size category during either day or night. So this is a regular um, uh, change in size distribution. Besides regular change, we also see irregular change. For example, in this cache, we observe that most of the time requests for this uh, for 
objects belong to this size category has is around 10%, while suddenly at this few hours, it increased to more than 20%, similar here and here. In the right figure, it's more severe. Requests for objects belong to this size category is most, mostly around 2%, while suddenly at here and here, it bursts to 60%. So that's a huge change. So what does this mean for um, system research? Size di distribution change often pose changes to the memory management system. For example, memcached is to rebalance slabs between different slab classes in order to adapt to the size distribution. In the paper, we show that this kind of slab rebalance is often suboptimal when we consider uh, regular or irregular size di distribution change. Therefore, we believe innovations are needed for better memory management techniques. Okay, while um, operations and object size has also been discussed in previous work, time to leave ha has really been mentioned in the previous work. Time to leave stands for, uh, it's short for TTL, it's specified how long an object can be used for serving requests after it's written into the cache. It is said that when an object is written to the cache and when an object expires, it cannot be used for serving. In other words, expired objects are not useful. So why TTLs are used? There are three TTL use cases. First, TTL is used to bound inconsistency. Because cache updates and cache writes are best effort. If a cache update fails, the client won't retry. It. So there's a possibility that the cache has an inconsistent view with as a database. That's what TTL are used to bound in this inconsistency. The second TTL use case is periodic refresh. This is mostly associated with cache found computations. Because cache found computation stores computation result that's based on dynamic features or dynamic properties. Therefore, the result needs to be periodically refreshed. Third, TTL are used for implicit deletion. For example, unimeters. Unimeters are counters within a certain window. After the window, the, the counters are not useful. So TTL is used to delete the counters. The third, uh, the, uh, Another example is the GDPR compliance. So GDPR requires deleted user data cannot be retained in the storage for a certain amount of time. So at Twitter, um, users use TTL to make sure that they follow GDPR. So that's how TTL um, are used. But now let's look at um, how TTL are used in practice. This figure shows the mean TTL um, across clusters. We observe that the mean TTL um, is shorter than 20 minutes for around 26% of the clusters. Well, for only for 25% of, uh, of the clusters, the TTL is longer than two days. Therefore, the TTLs are usually short for in-memory cache clusters. So what does short TTL mean? Short TTLs need to bounded working set size. In this two figure, we show that the working set size over one week for two caches. When we don't consider TTL, which is the blue curve, the working set size grows over time in, in both cache. While if we consider TTL, the working set size is almost always bounded as we show in the red curves. So therefore, there's no need for huge cache size if expired objects can be removed in time. So for example, for this cache, we only need three gigabytes if we, we can remove uh, expired objects in time. So what does this mean? It means efficient proactive TTL expiration techniques are more important than eviction. Because the expiration removes objects that will no longer be used in the future, while eviction removes objects that could potentially be used in the future, therefore, um, TTL expiration are more important than evictions in a memory cache. In the paper, we studied different um, TTL expiration techniques, and we show that these techniques are either not sufficient or not effective, or not efficient. 
and we believe that um, innovations are needed on efficient TTL expansion. Okay, so far we have talked about um, red heavy worker, object size, and, and revolution, and TTL. Due to time limit, we do, in the paper we show that there are more uh, discussions on production statistics. We show that production cash have a small miss ratio with small variations. The small variation is very important to um, production cash. Second, we show that um, request spikes are not always caused by hot keys. We also studied object popularity, and we show that most workload follow ZPN distribution with large parameter alpha. In other words, these workloads are highly skewed, while some workloads show some small deviations. The last we, we studied eviction algorithm. We show that the best eviction algorithm is highly workload dependent. And we observe four types of results. And we show that FIFO compared to LU achieve similar miss ratio across workloads. So as a summary of today's talk, we observe a non-trivial fraction of dry heavy workloads. And we suggest that future research on in-memory caching should also optimize for dry heavy workloads in addition to read heavy workloads. Second, we observe that objects are small in in-memory cache. Therefore, per object metadata is really expensive. Therefore, future research on reducing miss ratio should seeking ways to reduce metadata size. Third, we show that object size distribution is not steady. Instead, it's dynamic, showing both regular and irregular patterns. Then, and this um, dynamic size distribution poses challenges to memory management um, techniques. Therefore, we think some revisit and innovations are needed for uh, memory management in caching. Third, we showed short TTLs are widely used in in-memory caching, and the proactive TTL exploration are more important than innovation. While existing techniques on TTL exploration are not efficient at all, not sufficient. Therefore, we believe innovations on proactive TTL exploration are needed. We open source the trace at the following URL and hope it's helpful to, to the community. <laughs>